Hello. <laughs> uh, so remember, you need your Barron's book on the 29th. That's uh, Thursday. So please make sure you have your Barron's book. If you do not have your Barron's book, do not come to school. Do not come to class. I don't want to see you because I've been reminding you incessantly, incessantly to have it. So don't you dare show up to my class uh, without it. Uh, you have a... 11 through 20 on Monday, 21 through 30 on Tuesday, Wednesday, you have a test, 24 minutes, you're focused and your spice are due then, you only have two assignments for this week, hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better about life, yes? And then that's it, friend, and then on Wednesday you'll pick up your schedule for the six weeks and four days that we have together, and then it's your AP exam, and then we watch movies and hang out and live life, sounds good to you? Sounds hella good to me if we're being honest. Uh, anyway, so please make sure you are prepared. Baron's book on the 29th. Let's go. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the gentleman who believes in the creation of the state of Pakistan? What is the name of the dude who believes in the creation of the state of Pakistan? And spoiler alert, he wins. Good. Who is it, Jing Hao? Muhammad Ali Jinnah, on your whiteboard, what year was the creation of the state of India? The independent state of India. Nice. Carlota. 1947. On your whiteboard, what year was the UN created? That was for you. What is it, Ryan? 1945 is the creation of the state of, uh, no, creation of the UN. On your whiteboard, please tell me what governing body created the state of Israel? What governing body created the state of Israel? Good. Melu. United Nations. United Nations. It's kind of funny. So the new national security advisor that just got, John Bolton, I'm 99% sure is his name, uh, he says the greatest threat to American uh, national security is the UN. Which is really interesting. He said that a couple years ago. So now he, he was in the Bush administration, he was in the Reagan administration, now he'll be in the Trump administration. So we'll see what he does. But yeah, I saw that this morning. Uh, I thought that was timely, if you will. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the document that it, uh, Jews use to justify the creation of the state of Israel. Please tell me, what document <coughs> did the Jews cite as justification for the creation of the state of Israel? I got one. No, that's India. Two, three, four. No, that's India. What is it, Callie? Balfour Declaration. Balfour Declaration, which was signed in 1919. It was used to justify. On your whiteboard, please tell does. Anyone remember what it's called if you believe in the creation of the state of Israel? Creation. No. No. <laughs> That's, yeah. That's, totally wrong. Sorry. That's totally wrong. Yeah, yeah, it really is. But it's fine. Does anyone remember? I, I taught it to you. No? Start with the Z? Zionist. Zionist. There you go. And Zionism is created in 1919 with what document? Um, Balfour Declaration. Balfour Declaration. There we go. Full circle. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the leader of Egypt? He is going to be the first powerful leader coming out of the Middle East. He is going to be uh, the most outspoken against Western influence in the region. And this will start a tradition of future leaders. Who is it, Walker? Nasser. Nasser. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the communist leader of Vietnam? He is going to lead a war, uh, a civil war the United States is going to get involved in. He will win and defeat the United States. Who is it? That's China. Who is it, Carlota? Ho Chi Minh. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Ho Chi Minh is supported by what government? Ho Chi Minh is supported by what government? Good. Who is it, Patrick? Soviet. Soviet Union. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is. Uh, please tell me what is. 
uh, the name of the country that is the most upset by the creation of Israel, mostly because their territory was taken from them. It was given away by a, col a colonizing country and given away, and now they still don't have their land back. Daniel, Palestine. Palestine. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... What year is the creation of India and Pakistan? What is it? What year did the partition of India occur in? Good. Come on, come on. Good. Reyna, what is it? 1947. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who led a civil disobedience and nonviolent revolution in order to achieve it. However, he ends up losing the long run. Jamal, Gandhi, on your whiteboard, please tell me, the crowning moment for Nasser is when he took what from the British? This is what he considered to be the last colonial stand, like the last colonial stand in his country. They took it uh, with great surprise to the rest of the world. Melu. Suez Canal. On your whiteboard, please tell me what country did France refuse to give up because two million white Frenchies live there and it was the largest exporter of French goods. So their economy completely depended on it. What is it, Abby? Algeria. Please tell me what is the name of the National Algerian Army that fought in the Algerian War. Don't tell me the Algerian army. <laughs> it's not called that. You need to watch my video. Okay. You're fine. You're fine. But you definitely need to. Yes. Hopefully you see. <laughs> what is it, Peyton? The front of the operation. Hey! Hey, you told her we did nothing yesterday. You told Peyton you that we did nothing yesterday. Stuff. We didn't do any, we just passed out papers. Walker, Peyton yeah. said that you said all we did was pass out papers yesterday. That's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> that means we're all on the same page there. Walker, look at all the stuff I covered. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Please tell me. All right, let's go. Here we go. <laughs> Walker. Look at all the stuff I covered, man. We took over a bunch of countries. We had a bunch of revolutions. We created two. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we go. So, uh, we're going to Africa now. That's where you should have written on your notes, Africa, yes? Okay, all of a sudden now we have this whole blackness movement. And I think the epitome of this blackness movement, movement is a movie called... Yeah, if you haven't seen it, man, you got to see it. It's awesome. It's really cool. Um, hopefully you've seen uh, that through that uh, Black Panther, they're pulling a lot of ancient traditions and stuff like that through the movie. They're also doing a movie, did I tell you? On um, what's the guy who went around and went on a... Uh, Mansa Musa. They're making a movie on Mansa Musa. Isn't that awesome? What is it called when he went across Africa into the Middle East? Why did he do that? Hajj, yes, it's a pilgrimage, because he's a true a believer of what religion? Islam, even though his grandfather named? Sundida. Sundida, yes. Sundida converted to Islam. Why did he convert to Islam, Gunner? So people were with him. Yes. Oh my God, do you remember things I taught you? Kind of. The answer was supposed to be yes, Gunner. The answer was yes, Gunner. That was the only correct answer. Okay. All right, here we go. So. It is an influence of black is beautiful. It's this whole movement of, you know, putting greater pride. Have you ever seen people walk around with uh, the continent of Africa on a necklace? Yeah? That's what this is all based on. It started in, like, the 1970s. Uh, 1960s, it started at the end. 1970s, it became a whole big thing. Um, when you start seeing people in here in the United States wearing traditional African gear, the head wraps and all that stuff, even though they were brought here as slaves, that whole going back to traditions, the native cultures and all that stuff, um, going back to natural hair instead of putting extensions in, 
flat ironing, African American hair, trying to have more Western look, that whole Afro thing, the dreads and all that stuff going back to traditional hair, all of that is part of this beautiful black. Black is beautiful, trying to change the narrative on uh, blacks all around the world from taking them from this whole slave population into now trying to make it uh, more beautiful, more powerful. Uh, has it worked? Has, have they really increased? Yesterday or three days ago, a black man was shot in the backyard of, a, of his grandmother's house on a cell phone. Have we not seen it? There's a video of it. Don't watch it unless you can. But um, So this whole movement is the precursor to the civil rights movement, saying that we are worthy, we are powerful, we deserve equality. And this is going to help build this whole surge of we're valued. And so we're going to see we're still struggling for that here. The fact that Black Panther is such a big deal here in 2018, why? It's all black people. It's 2018, and this is like one of the first films where everything is mostly black people, correct? So think of how important this movement is, this whole resurgence, and how slow it's taken. What, Gunner? What? What? It's good. So it's 100 million away from becoming the largest grossing movie in history. So that'd be pretty cool. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it. If you've seen it once, maybe see it twice, it'd be pretty cool. You didn't like it, Elizabeth? Oh, you gotta see it. It's so good. It's really good. And the soundtrack? It's boss. All right, here we go. So Ghana is the first sub-Saharan colony to achieve independence in 1957, okay? We're gonna see Nkrumah is going to be the leader of Ghana, and it's going to celebrate with uh, Queen Elizabeth in 1961. I already asked this reference yesterday. No one knew it, but I'm going to say it again. Did anyone watch The Queen? You watched it? Oh, you know how she, have you, did you finish season two? Okay, when she's in Africa and she asks the king to, for a dance and then she's dancing along, that was the diplomacy of showing that there's a connection. That is part of, that's that. That's, uh, uh, Nukuma is him. Isn't that cool? It's really well done. Anyway, so, leader of Ghana, uh, Ghana and Britain today are actually very friendly. They're still very friendly. Uh, Ghana is actually one of the preeminent <coughs> countries in Africa. It has one of the greatest influences. Does anyone know what country is the most successful country in Africa? What is Sarah? South Africa does very well, except they're running out of water right now, which is not so good, but that's a whole other issue. Adi? Nigeria, Nigeria is the most advanced country in Africa. They also have a higher literacy rate than the United States. What's the least? It's the least? Probably the Democratic Republic of Congo. By the way, they're executing their own people again. We have another, um, we start I'm starting to see another genocide occurring in the Congo. So that's happening. Um, there's some. Nigeria's killing it right now. They're doing really well. Kenya's doing really, really well. Stuff like that. You can't make broad assumptions. Yeah, like that. A lot of them are in Africa, but why are they the most corrupt? Yes, because the Europeans completely destroyed and stole all of the resources and all that stuff. And when they left, it was power vacuum, and who came into power? A bunch of thugs with guns and people and stealing children from houses and forcing them to fight for them. Real leadership. Ooh, so that's why Africa's a hot day mess. All right, so Kenya, here we go. Kenya's also doing really well. So keep in mind, Ghana is the first country in Africa to earn its independence. And Queen Elizabeth kind of gives it to them and says, you know what? Here, we're not going to fight you for it. Here you go. But you're not going to completely disrespect me, which is why she flies down there. And they're so we're going to have like a relationship. We're not just going to cut ties and go to war or anything like that. Okay, so what we're going to see is that we're going to see an attack by the Kenyans on the British starting in 1947. By 1952, a state of emergency is going to be declared trying to save British lives in Kenya. Now, after uh, once the state of emergency is called, 12,000 Africans are going to be killed, uh, while only 100 Europeans are going to be killed. Okay, so who has the advantage? <coughs> Hello? The British, yes. Okay. 
So what we're going to see, um, the British are eventually going to leave in 1963 after this. Why are they going to negotiate leaving? Why are they going to give it up? Hello? We live in, this is 1963. There's video cameras, there's photographers all over the world. What is going to force Britain to give up Kenya? Why, Gunnar? public relations nightmare. Everyone in the world is judging Great Britain for doing this atrocities, correct? Which is why they gave up India. Not because they wanted to, but having an image of you beating an Indian who's not even fighting back, who's sitting there peacefully while you're like killing him. Okay? It's really hard to get over that. It's the same thing that's going to happen in Kenya. Now, eventually, the Kenyans and the British are going to be good friends. Um, and Kenya uh, still welcomes the royal family from Britain still to this day. By the way, fun fact. All right, South Africa, the apartheid. You can raise your hand and tell me what you know about the apartheid. You should know this. Sarah, killing it. Is it segregate like the United States or worse? There you go. Okay, now, I am in no way saying that Jim Crow laws here in the United States are good. Do you hear what I'm saying? They're incredibly embarrassing when we look back at our country and how racist we were as a whole country to allow those laws to exist. Yes? Yes? You hear what I'm saying? I'm no way saying that Jim Crow laws were fine. I'm not saying that at all. I will tell you the apartheid was much more severe. Yes? Okay? Essentially, if you were black, you were supposed to stay out of the sight of white people. In America, if you were black, you just had to cross the street so you would get out of the white people's way. You see the difference? White people are here, you're supposed to go away, hide so they don't have to see you. Do you see the difference between the two? Okay? It's a tiering system, and there's a whole big, they're much more extreme uh, than the United States is, even though the United States was not good. Not good. Not good. All right, so the apartheid, 87% of the entire country is given to white people. Okay, how many white, what percentage of the population do you think are white? 10% of the population in South Africa are white, yet they get 87% of the land. That seems fair, right? Okay, divisions of Africans into tribes, settlement, and homelands. So they're pushing all of the black people the actual Africans out of cities and out of places where the white people are so they don't have to see them. They don't want to see them. Okay? We're going to start seeing the African National Congress is going to come together in Freedom Charter in 1955, and they're eventually going to start pushing for public support in order to end uh, the apartheid. Now, who is the most important person in South Africa? You should know two South Africans. First one is who, Munson? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Who's the second South African you should know? He does a really funny TV show every night. Who is it? Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah wrote a book. Uh, huh? He wrote a book. I can't think of what it was called at the moment. It's called Born a Crime. Born a Crime. There you go. Zach, you are on it, man. You were killing it. Uh, Trevor Noah was born during the apartheid. His mom is black. And his dad is white, which is why the name of his book is Born a Crime. He was obviously born in the last 10 years of the apartheid, because eventually will be abolished under Nelson Mandela and all that. Um, but his parents couldn't, it was illegal for them to be seen together. So when he was out in public, because he's black, he looks black, he's a light-skinned black, but he wasn't allowed to talk to his father in public. If he did, his mom and him would get arrested and all that stuff. It was really crazy. Now, towards the end of the apartheid, it gets less severe. Does that make sense? Um, but still a big issue. So, dismantling the apartheid. So, we have Nelson Mandela. And if you don't know who that is, where have you been? Two or three years ago. Yeah. I don't think that's it at all. No, yeah, 
bear it's the bear. first idea that could come up with. I like the bear and bears. I thought we'd have them in the air. So, okay. Here, go Google it, and I guarantee that'll be like one of the top All right, I'm going to have to Google this. All right, so Mandela is going to be sent to jail. Why is he going to be sent to jail? Protesting, absolutely. He made an example out of himself um, and got sent to jail. While he was in jail for like 15 years, right? 15 or 18 years, an extremely long amount of time. He sat there and was starting to write letters to newspapers, to world leaders, trying to gain support. What he did, uh, he broke one of the apartheid laws, uh, a bunch of them, but was trying to protest the apartheid. While he was in jail, he wrote a very famous book uh, and eventually uh, gained worldwide attention to the apartheid crisis in South Africa. When he gets out, uh, in 1994, he runs to be the first uh, black president of South Africa, and he wins. He wins, and he becomes uh, president of South Africa. He does it for like four terms, five terms. Uh, instead of coming into power and punishing all the whites, which would make logical sense, correct? He spent 18 or 20-something years in prison himself because of unfair laws based on his race. He didn't come out and want to punish all the whites for what they've done to blacks. He wanted to unify the country. And he was an incredibly peaceful, very powerful, very passionate man. And one of the first real things that he did was support uh, South African rugby. South African rugby is a predominantly what sport? White or black? When you think rugby players, what color are their skin? White people. It's a bunch of white people. Huh? Right. We don't use that term. <laughs> Bloody. Is that what the reference is? Got it. It's typically a bunch of white people. So what he did is he threw all of, uh, you, all of the government in support and got all of the black and white citizens of, uh, of South Africa to unify behind their rugby team. And guess what? Their rugby team won the world championship of rugby that year. And it was one of the unifying forces that everyone was kind of brought together. Not that it solved every problem, but you know, when you have something that everyone can cheer for, it kind of brings people together and it's a huge impact. There's a bunch of movies about it. Okay, there's one with Matt Damon. He has a terrible accent. Don't watch it. It's all it's kind of really painful. It's kind of really painful to watch, but it's a good one. Okay? Alright, to the boards, here we go. And then we'll make it to China. All right, here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the first African country to gain its independence? Okay, they're going to break away. And because it doesn't have that much value to bring, they're kind of like, God damn it. Who is it, Caroline? Donna. Donna, if you watch season two of The Crown, you're going to see the queen dance with him in order to sue things over, in order to avoid war. It's kind of cool. She's kind of a boss. It's all because Jacqueline Kennedy made her do it. You know that reference to Washington. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the social class system in South Africa? It was a race-based system. It was used to separate black and whites. It gave 80% of land to the whites. What do we got? Christian, apartheid. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the gentleman who is going to overthrow the apartheid? He will eventually become uh, the leader of South Africa for, I think, about like 15 years and modernize it and is considered like a world hero, for God's sake. He's awesome. Who is it, Carlota? Nelson Mandela. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... Uh, what country is going to go to uh, war with Great Britain? It's going to be incredibly bloody and awful. The British are going to lose the war on PR, so they end up giving it back. Who is it, Callie? Kenya. Now, when we talk about all this stuff with the British, please tell me, who is the leader of England during this time on your whiteboard? Good. Who is it? Colton. Elizabeth queen Elizabeth II. She is the Queen of England. Of course, we're going to have multiple Prime Ministers after. Stop my smiling, Patrick. Okay. Uh, we're going to see, obviously, we typically refer to this as Prime Ministers, but when you're losing colonies, it's actually the Queen who deals with that mostly. 
the prime ministers will actually be dealing with more of the military components of it if they're going to do it. So a lot of the Kenya and a lot of the giving up Kenya officially, that was the Queen's decision. Uh, Ghana was the Queen's decision to go in there and try to save it, all of that. Um, all right, let's go to China. Okay, so China, last time we left it, okay, we had Sun Yat-sen in power, correct? Yep, Sun Yat-sen is rising into power, and he sends people on a long march. What do we call that? The long march. Look at you. And what famous dude is sent on a long march? Mao. Mao is sent on this long march. And while, while he's marching, like a thousand miles or something, or 1,200 miles, he starts writing a book and starts writing some essays and starts sending them out. So, Sun Yat-sen is in power, yet we have a guy named Mao rising into power. So, massive, uh, so China, obviously we're switching to China, okay? So China is trying to evolve and is trying to grow. So, in 1955, they're going to do the first five-year plan. Oh my God, that sounds so familiar. Why should it sound so familiar, Karishma? Stalin did a five-year plan. So what do you think China's trying to do? They're trying to mimic. Absolutely. Because rem remember, under Stalin, Russia's going to industrialize. You need to write that down. All of these you need to write down, and you're going to tell me if it's successful or not successful. And I'll tell you that here in a second. So Stalin is going to do the five-year plan when he comes into power. Does it work in Russia? Yeah. Absolutely. It absolutely does. And it <clears throat> is going to transform Russia completely. So, if you're a Chinese who's also trying to be communist, okay, who's also not industrialized, who are you going to model most of your government after? Russia. Because who's also supporting China? Russia. Russia. So they're like, hell yeah, we're getting money from these people. They're clearly in a similar situation we were, so we're going to kind of mimic them. So they do the first five year plan. Ah, not so successful. You're going to want to write that down. The first five-year plan, not so successful. However, lays foundation for industrialization. No one's like, yeah, wow, that was great. Under Stalin, do we say, yeah, wow, that was great? Yes, wow, it was great. <laughs> uh, in China, yeah, it does lay the foundation. Now, they're going to do the great leap forward. Epic failure. Epic failure. They mess up the farming. It's going to kill millions of people. We're not actually sure the count uh, because China won't release the numbers. So we don't know how many millions died, but a million people are going to die. Millions of people are going to die. The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution is incredibly successful, yet limited. Okay? It's going to change China significantly. However, it's not going to achieve the gains it wanted to. Does that make sense? So it's going to have a huge impact transform China. However, it's not going get, to get where they want. So, you're going to see um, you're going to see that Mao is going to uh, be replaced by Dejan. I'm not even going to try. This guy is going to replace Mao. And we're going to see Tiananmen Square protests. Tiananmen Square uh, in China, by the way, I'm going to China next summer if you want to come. We got little flyers over there. We're going to Tiananmen Square. So excited. Apparently they got a ch uh, Clock museum, isn't that what you told me? Yeah! Who brought the clocks? Matteo Ricci, that's what they all love, right? And he's what faith? Christian. Christian, but what specific Christian? Catholic. No. Jesuit. Jesuit, yes! Oh my god, we have learned something. This is so wonderful. Okay, so we're going to have some protests, which we'll get to. A lot of this is going to be covered next week. We really focus on a lot on China, because China transforms in 19, starting in 1955. So, Indian democracy. Okay, so we're going back to India here. Now, Indian democracy is going to flourish under Indira Gandhi. Is this the Gandhi? No, Gandhi is actually a really common surname. So you need to make sure that every time you see Gandhi, you're not equating him with the Gandhi. Okay, so... Um, there's no relationship to, Mahandi, uh, to our Gandhi, the one we think of. They're going to start a green revolution, which is a very big deal. You need to put a big star next to it. 
Okay, in India, they're going to start the Green Revolution, which is going to increase food production. Why is that a big deal? So, India, do, do you think they're going to have a huge population while the British are there or a small population? Small. Small. Why would they have a small population with a hand? Why? <coughs> Why would they have a pretty small population? Hello. Would, do you think the British are going to allow them to really be outnumbered and grow that big? No. Okay, so after the British leave, they do the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is focused on agricultural, which is focusing on what? Agricultural is what? Food. The more food you have, what happens? The larger the population. Why is that a big deal here in 2018? Huh? Overpopulation. Well, they have one of the like, third largest population in the world. And it literally all starts happening in 1950-something. Like, uh, uh, like okay, this whole green revolution. So is it successful? Absolutely it's successful. Yeah. India is going through some rough times now. They've had a couple of really severe droughts. Um, uh, so a lot of people have died because of that. But their population. So it's going to slow. Uh, they're going to try to slow down population growth because they have so much more food now with this green revolution that they're going to try sterilizing people. Do we consider that a modern idea? Do we support it? Uh, okay. Uh, and they're also going to uh, uh, re have repressive policies. Okay. Uh, in Nidra is going to be assassinated by bodyguards. Okay. And eventually will die, obviously. All right. Muslims are going to be... Uh, so this is the United States, by the way. We're transitioning to the U.S. Okay, uh, Islamism. It's an actual phrase, by the way. And this is the negative perception of Muslims here in the United States. Do you agree that's true? Here in 2018, do we still have a problem with this? Yeah. Absolutely, we do. Okay, so Muslims are increasingly regarded in negative terms. Okay, this is going to uh, be occurred because of lack of information, of course. How much? about Islam did you learn before my class? Isn't that sad? It's going to be the largest uh, largest religion in the world within the next 10 years. Don't you think that's weird you didn't learn about it? No? Did you learn about Christianity in your classes? Like the development of Christianity and how, like the Roman Empire and all that crap? Yeah? Sort of? Are we alive? Are we dead? Are we going to meet our Allah here? Allah means God. Anyway. So, CIA. <laughs> so, um, have you ever wondered why Iran hates us? Hello? So, have you heard of the Iranian deal? Hold on. Yes. Uh, no, it's not going to be done by Reagan. It's going to be done by Clinton. Okay. So, one of the big topics is, so yesterday, H.R. McAllister. McAllister? McMaster. McMaster. There you go. Sorry, there's been so many changes. It's hard to keep up, you know. Uh, Mc... McMaster. I really want to say McAllister. I don't know where that's coming from, but I really like it. What is it? McMaster. <laughs> McMaster was fired yesterday. Uh, the reason why uh, Trump fired him yesterday because it wasn't expected. Even the guy John Brody, who got repl who's replacing him, which was announced on Twitter yesterday, was completely surprised that it was announced yesterday, even though they've been talking about it for weeks. And the reason is, is because the whole world is getting together in about a month to decide whether to sign the Iran deal. Every five or eight years, all the countries who originally signed the Iran deal get together and reevaluate it and re-sign it to make sure everyone is doing their part. Now, the Iran deal is a very big deal. It is a big deal because it's limiting Iran's ability to have nuclear weapons, okay? We have taken sanctions on them and put sanctions on them to limit their ability to create a bomb, just like we've done with North Korea. Now, the most important thing is, is that Kim Jong-un in North Korea hates everybody. Iran hates us the most. So, the whole Iran deal is to save the whole world, which is why Britain, France, Germany are all in it, to keep this country under control, correct? However, the United States is the most invested in creating this Iran deal because Iran hates us 
more than anything in the whole damn world. Okay? And the reason is, by the way, so the reason why he was fired yesterday is for the deal. What does President Trump say about the Iran deal? Worst deal in history. So he may not sign it in about a month. Why do we care? Why do they hate us so much? Oh, it's because we sent the CIA into Iran to kill the leader of Iran in uh, 1979. Guess what we didn't do? We didn't. We got caught red-handed trying to execute the leader of Iran. Now, imagine if Iran sent someone to the United States to kill our president. How would we feel about that? Yeah, we would be angry and we want to bomb the hell out of them, correct? So, we got caught red-handed in Iran trying to kill their leader. So, the Iran deal is a very big reason we don't want a country that absolutely hates us and that has very up and down political flows to have a nuclear weapon. Can we agree? As Americans, we're even more concerned about this because they hate us more than anything because we got caught. And we did. So, U.S. hostages are going to be held for about two years. Um, have you ever seen that terrible, terrible movie? Obviously not. Stupid of me to ask. Argo? These are like real life references, people. Argo, it's with Ben Affleck. He pretends to make a movie in Iran. So he smuggles like seven people out of Iran. No? Cool. Iran holds about 2,000 hostages, American hostages, in the U.S. Embassy for about two years. And eventually we are able to put them on a plane and fly them out. Have you heard of this? Iran hostage. Yes? Thank you, Karishma. Have you seen Argo? Did you like it? It was okay. It was okay. The whole movie is about saving nine people. There's 2,000 people sitting on the floor of an embassy. You know? It's kind of like, ah, why don't we focus on the two? Anyway, never mind. All right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. See, here's our U.S. diplomats. Nice 70s look. Do you find this at least interesting at all? This is literally shaping our whole world. So next month, Trump's going to decide whether to sign or not sign the Iran deal. And the Iran deal is based on...